In the golden age of the American Mafia, Joey Gallo bucks the trend. A rebel who wants a revolution. Joey Gallo was not going to play by the rules. And he would do anything to get to the top. He's the Che Guevara of mobdom. This is unheard of in the Mafia. A rising star in the New York Mafia, Gallo brushes off Bobby Kennedy's investigation and in his own mind becomes invincible. He was a psychopathic killer. And that was why he got that name, Crazy Joe. Gallo's whole life is a violent fantasy based on a movie. Joey Gallo is literally acting the part of a movie gangster. He looks like this freak 1940s movie villain. Slipping between different realities, a murderer with an alter ego as a beatnik artist. He's real eccentric. He's smoking reefers with his beatnik wife. But the mob's not going to let Joey write a happy ending for the movie in his mind. It was the most dramatic ending of any gangster film you could ever watch. New York, summer 1971. A festive crowd has rallied for the Italian-American Civil Rights League in a celebration of cultural identity. But in fact, the popular event is a front for the American Mafia. They did make a lot of money. It, it was said that they made maybe a million, two million dollars. It was just a big scam. The league is in fact run by one of New York's most dangerous and powerful mafia crime bosses, Joe Colombo. Mr. Colombo, are you a boss of the mafia? No, I am not. Is there a mafia? No, there is not. Today, Joe Colombo's on his way to address a league rally. It may all be a sham, but he is worshipped by many in the Italian-American community. Colombo shows up, surrounded with bodyguards, and a massive roar comes out of the audience. Great cheer. As if a conquering hero had showed up, you know? He's waving, waving, waving. At the same time, 24-year-old Jerome Johnson threads his way towards him. Jerome Johnson was wearing a press card and had a camera, and he moseyed up to Joe Colombo. But Johnson is no journalist. He pulls out a handgun and a point blank opens fire. He shot Joe Colombo in the head. I think he hit him three times in the head. Detective Mike Sheenan is caught in the mayhem. I see Colombo go down. I see a bunch of guys run to him. But in the ensuing chaos and mayhem, Colombo's bodyguard guns down Johnson. The Mafia Don is rushed to the hospital, where he slips into a coma from which he will never emerge. The police immediately get to work trying to figure out who would be foolish enough to assassinate Colombo. This guy was a dope. How the hell are you going to shoot Joe Colombo and then get out of that crowd? He's going to be killed instantaneously. Jerome Johnson had been set up. And whoever sent him to kill Colombo was stepping over a line. Only in extremely rare circumstances could a top mob boss be targeted from within the Mafia. It had been a cornerstone of Mafia law since 1931. The rule was the only thing that stood between good business and anarchy. But someone wasn't playing by the rules. The biggest violation you could commit in um, the Mafia was trying to kill a boss without the authorization of the commission. 
whoever was behind the assassination of Colombo hadn't sought the permission of the New York family heads known as the Commission. The authority of the Mafia is under attack. And suddenly, everyone wants to know who ordered the hit. It seems likely the work of a lone wolf. And only one man fits the bill. The obvious choice was Joe Gallo. Gallo had said many times, Columbo, he's dead, I'm gonna kill him. He's a dead man. Crazy Joey Gallo was a ghost from Columbo's past. A man at war with Columbo's crime family until he was sent down by the justice system. Driven to ruin by the same Mafia Don who once raised him up from the streets, Gallo has had eight long years to plot his revenge on the family that betrayed him. When Joey got out of jail, he was playing by new rules, his own rules. He made them up and he would kill anybody who stood in his way. Joey Gallo's history with the mob goes back some 20 years to Red Hook, Brooklyn, where he worked for the Profaci family, a rising power in the mafia. He was killing people at a young age. And there was kind of a fear that spread from that. He was actually diagnosed to be schizophrenic when he was just a teenager. And then growing up, his whole persona matched that. Crazy Joey Gallo wasn't called crazy for nothing. An obsessive fan of the movies, Gallo finds the perfect role model for his violent alter ego on the silver screen. He looked just like the psychotic killer, Tommy Udo, from this 1947 film noir, Kiss of Death. He wore Tommy Udo's exact outfit, black jacket, black shirt, white tie. He even had that kooky, unnerving grin and odd bursts of laughter. And Joey Gallo's act quickly draws the attention of the boss of Brooklyn's leading mafia family, Joe Profaci. That family had always been in Brooklyn. They were big on gambling. They were big on the loan sharking. They were big on controlling the waterfront, where a lot of crimes were committed. Joe Profaci sees the potential in Gallo and believes he has the perfect stage for Joey's rage-fueled act. The Brooklyn Business District. Joey Gallo filled a very specific role for the mob, which was he was extremely effective at extortion. He was a strong arm guy. That's what he did. If somebody didn't pay him, then he would kill him. Joey's crazy new character is a hit. Under Joe Profaci's patronage, Joey Gallo graduates from bit part player to supporting role as enforcer for the Profaci family. But Joey wants more. He wants top billing. But the Profacis are the only mob in Brooklyn. Gallo knows the only way up is within the organization, as a made man. Being made in the Mafia was just something that was supposed to be done if you were a young upstart hoodlum. I mean, that's your dream. But to get made, Joey will have to pass a lethal audition. In the Mafia, the traditional way to get made is called making your bones, and which of course is uh, doing a hit on somebody. But Profaci doesn't ask Joey Gallo to hit just anyone. In October 1957, Joe Profaci orders Joey Gallo to kill the notorious Albert Anastasia, a rival Mafia crime boss and feared executioner known as the Butcher of Brooklyn. Albert Anastasia was one of the most ruthless bastards on the face of the earth. But in the movie in Joey's mind, Anastasia is the monster Gallo was born to slay. The stakes couldn't be higher. If Gallo succeeds, the promotion he craves seems certain. Failure means death. 
but psychopathic Joey knows no fear. <laughs> October 25th, 1957. 10.15 a.m. Anastasia is so confident no one would dare to attack him that he relaxes at the barber's alone. Gallo makes his move. The mob has a new executioner. Word gets around that these Gallo brothers are the guys who pulled off the hit on Anastasia. Uh, it gives him major cred in the underworld. Gallo has killed for the Profaci boss, and now he's a paid up member of the Profaci family. It's a mobster dream come true. Joey Gallo and his brothers move to new headquarters in Brooklyn, and with Joe Profaci's blessing, start expanding their criminal operations. America's 50s youth culture is exploding, and Joey Gallo is there to milk it. The Gallos were known as the jukebox kings. They ran the jukebox extortion racket. There's a lot of quarters being plunked in, new jukeboxes. Joey is also pushing soda fountains, pinball machines, and running nightclubs. Despite it seeming like a small time operation, Gallo's success begins attracting unwanted attention. In the form of the US government and its chief counsel, Robert Kennedy. In 1958, Joey Gallo and his brothers are summoned to testify before a Senate committee on organized crime. But it's Gallo the movie star that turns up. When Joey Gallo is called before Robert Kennedy's McClellan committee, he shows up in his black coat and he's wearing sunglasses. He looks like this freak 1940s movie villain, this charismatic wild man. From the start, it's quite obvious Joey is not going to kowtow to authority, not even the US governments. You see this larger than life movie gangster is going face to face against Robert Kennedy in this nationally televised street fight. I respectfully decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. Throughout the televised hearings, Joey acts out the gangster role he has invented for himself. He's defiantly telling the senators, I'm pleading the fifth, over and over and over. It's like this sort of act of disrespect against the system. Despite Kennedy's best efforts, there is no concrete evidence to incriminate Joe Gallo. And America's public enemy number one is free to walk. Joey Gallo definitely got under Robert Kennedy's skin. I mean, Kennedy said this was the toughest hood I ever had to face. Crazy Joe is now feeling invincible. After his performance in front of the McClellan Committee, Joey Gallo comes out literally a mob star. Gallo's reputation now has gone nationwide. You could walk in any bar in Manhattan, people would be like, oh, that's the guy I was on television. He was now a celebrity gangster not just Joey Gallo from Red Hook. To the public at large, he may seem like a big fish, but within the family, he's still small fry. It seems that Joe Gallo has it made. He's successful, he's flashy, but the one thing that Joey Gallo doesn't have is power. Behind the facade, Gallo knows he's still just a hired hand. He's having to kick back the majority of his earnings to old man Profaci, and despite all the trappings, he's still sort of running the jukebox racket, this nickel and dime extortion thing. And that's just where old man Profaci wants Gallo to stay, 
the mob had no room for flashy, tough guys like Joey Gallo. Joe Perfacci looked at Joey Gallo and his brothers like clowns, puppets, so to speak. They'll do whatever I want to do, and I'll promise them the moon, but I'll give them shit. Despite the act, Gallo isn't stupid. He knows he's being sidelined, that he isn't part of Profacci's plans. For Joey Gallo, it was a real front that old man Profacci never invited him to the compound for Sunday spaghetti. We're good enough to take someone out for the old man, but we're not good enough to sit at his table. It's a dangerous situation. An unstable mind like Gallo's can easily be tipped over the edge. He's looking at his mafia, Don, and he's saying, you know, we're doing all these things for him. What's he doing for us? Joey Gallo knows what a gangster screen hero would do. Let's get some shotguns and do what we need to get done. It's this movie idea of what a gangster is. It's one crazy guy against the system. He's going to go and take what he wants. You gotta remember, he's a psychopath. And it developed in his head that he could take this guy out and take over this entire family. Joe Profacci is about to learn that when you sit on a psycho killer like Crazy Joe, you're sitting on a time bomb. Joey Gallo's really, in many ways, sort of the classic idea of a juvenile delinquent from the 1950s. That almost Marlon Brando-esque idea of rebellion. Why do I have to live by these old world Baroque ordainments by old man Profacci? Joe Profacci senses danger, and his first instinct is to keep Gallo on side. The Profaccis did see some use in the Gallo brothers. They made the mafia money, so all right, well, we can tolerate an eccentric as long as he makes us money. In an attempt to keep Gallo under control, Profacci offers him an extraordinary assignment. To kill one of his own, Frankie Schotts, a captain in the Profacci family in charge of the numbers rackets. The numbers boss, Frankie Schatz, was holding out against old man Profacci. He wasn't giving Joe Profacci his money. And so Profacci's like, well, we're going to have to get Frankie Schatz whacked. The promise was, you take him out and you guys take over his operation, which was a big chunk of Profacci's crime world. Joey and his brothers take Profacci at his word. It's the kind of hit that would grace any Hollywood gangster film. To them, it's a bit of honor. They wasted no time. They went out there and they riddled this guy with bullets. He had like 10, 15 bullets in face. The Gallows are ecstatic. Frankie Schott's empire is worth a cool two and a half million. They were thrilled now. They thought this was it. But this time, there is a twist in the plot. Profacci changes the deal. He hands over the lucrative share of Schott's racket to his brother-in-law. Profacci basically betrayed them. When word gets around, Joey Gallo is pushed over the edge. The gangsters were like, hey, you got duped, huh? You're a moron. You went and killed a guy and you got shit for it. That's the way it is. Welcome to Profacci's world. And Gallo went berserk. I mean berserk. This isn't how the movie is supposed to go. So Joey rewrites a new ending. And it's not good news for Profacci. For Joey Gallo, what's the quickest way to success in the Mafia? No, I'm not going to spend all my life being a cog in this system. I'm going to do it my own way, even if it means tearing down the entire machine. we got to start a revolution here. March 1960. If there's going to be a revolution, it's going to be done the Gallo way. Joey Gallo's idea was Let's kill them all. Let's like take the old man, we'll kidnap him, we'll kidnap his underlings, and we'll just, yeah, let's kill him. In the history of the American Mafia, there has never been a plot like it. No one takes down a boss without permission of the ruling body. 
But then, Joey Gallo is a rebel. This doesn't exactly conform with the rules of a coup in the mafia, and there actually sort of were, you know, traditions of how you're going to do it. If you're going to make a coup, you're going to have to get permission of the mafia commission. The commission had been set up by Lucky Luciano to stop violence erupting within the mob. For 30 years, its authority has been unquestioned. Now, Joey Gallo wants a revolution. Joey's version is, screw the commission. Let's, you know, we're going to do it our own way. Why do we need their approval for? You know, we're doing a coup. And when Gallo takes care of Profacci, he's going to demand to be the headline act. Gallo's master plan was to whack Profacci and then just step into his shoes. February 1961, Joey Gallo's audacious coup springs into action. Across Manhattan, 20 of his henchmen target the Profaci high command. They pulled it almost like a commando raid. In one afternoon, they grabbed five close aides, including the top aide to the boss of the family. This was unheard of. It is a stunning gambit, and the Gallo assault takes the Profaci's off guard. You have a couple crazy young Gallo brothers trying to kidnap the Don. This is unheard of in the Mafia. I mean, what an act of disrespect, especially if you're the guys in the bottom of the totem pole. The cream of the Profaci High Command is held at gunpoint in a Manhattan hotel room. It looks like a stunning coup, but for one thing, the top dog is still at large. They kidnap the Don's tight inner circle, but they miss the one guy that they need, which is the Don. If you go after the king, you gotta kill him. Acting on a tip-off, Joe Profaci has skipped town. Too late, the head of the family had learned just how dangerous mad Joey Gallo can be. Profaci took off down to Florida. I'm out of here. He knew he was a psychopathic killer. With Profaci safe, the tables are turned and the gallows are in the corner. The question is, what can they do about it? Practical and cool-headed, Joey's elder brother, Larry, suggests approaching the commission to broker a deal. Larry Gallo is, let's wait. The commission's gonna tell us what to do. We're gonna resolve this without violence. Joey Gallo doesn't do deals. For him, it's death or glory. Joey's the exact opposite. He's like, let's show him that we mean business. Kill one of the hostages and dump him on the old man's doorstep. Larry Gallo lays it out for his mad brother. Kill a Profaci, and the boss will come back at them with an army of 200 soldiers. Joey's plan is in ruins. In the end, Joey's big brother pulls rank and takes control. The only solution that doesn't end in a bloodbath is to negotiate. And the commission agrees. The commission's idea of how to settle this coup is no violence. Let's not create more attention to the mafia because it's bad for business. We don't want a lot of feds on us because of a bunch of crazy Gallo brothers. The commission orders Joe Profaci to broker a truce and the Gallos to release their hostages. Joey, the revolutionary, an all-or-nothing idealist is being forced to play by the rules. To Joey, the coup was an utter disaster. Not, not only did they not kill the Don, they followed the commission's rules. For Joey, the idea of a revolution is, let's go to the streets and let's do it our own way. Any normal mobster would lie low. But Joey Gallo is no normal mobster. 
His next move is unique in the history of the Mafia. Gallo tunes in and drops out. He heads to Greenwich Village, the hotbed of the anti-establishment counterculture scene of the early 1960s. Joey really took a liking to Greenwich Village. It was a center where those in their 20s were rebelling against capitalism. Joey embraces every aspect of the beatnik crowd. The revolutionary hothead swaps the gun for the bong. He's smoking reefers. He's chewing hash, like chewing tobacco. Joey, in his own way, is going through the classic beatnik mind expansion. Gallo falls for a woman, Jeffy Lee, who for a time softens his gangster alter ego. Joey was really living in a black and white world at the time. And here's a young, wild, free Jeffy. She opened up his world to a whole rainbow of colors. And just like before, Joey embraces his new role and pushes it to the limit. There's jazz, there's tons of sex, and a lot of weed. But if Joey is trying to escape his demons, the Mafia have no intention of letting him. Joe Profacci may have agreed a truce in public, but he wants revenge. Profacci said, that guy's dead. Profacci was from the old school that you never took on the boss, you had total obedience. And the idea that Gallo would start a rebellion against him meant one thing, he was out to kill Gallo. Profaccio said, that guy's dead. And he goes, I gotta eliminate the threat before they come to me. And then the war began. May, 1961. A grim message signals that the bloodbath has begun. The first victim, Gallo hitman, Joey Jelly. A package was dropped in front of the restaurant. And inside was a dead fish and the clothes of Joey's best hitman. It's a Sicilian message. Inside the clothes of Joe Jelly is a dead fish, hence Joe Jelly sleeps with the fishes. Next on Joe Profacci's hit list is Joey's elder brother, Larry. Lured to a meeting in a secluded bar, Larry is unaware he may be enjoying his last drink. He was sitting at the bar, and all of a sudden two guys come behind him and put a rope around his neck and start to strangle him. Luckily for Larry Gallo, a local cop pops in for happy hour. A sergeant walked in the front door, and they see him, and they flee. Larry Gallo survives. But the message hits home loud and clear. Joey Gallo is next on Joe Profacci's death list. It's time to reprise his old role. The hipster is put on hold, and Crazy Joey the Psycho Killer is back. For Joey, it's like, all right, well, they mess with my brother. It's time to go to war. Let's do it my way now. Like, let's take it to the system. Hellbent on an all-out war, Joey turns his HQ into a fortress. The Profacci's aren't going to hit them again so easily. It was called going to the mattresses, and this became their fort. They put barbed wire up on the roof. They got chicken wire and put it on all the windows so that a hand grenade or a bomb could not be tossed through. This was an all-out war. This is the role Joey craves. Outgunned and outnumbered, it's Crazy Joe against the establishment. And it'll end in a brutal bloodbath. He's the Che Guevara of mobdom. He's ready to, to go full on against the Profaci family, and he thinks he's gonna win. Red Hook, Brooklyn, November 8th, 
1961. To Verdi's rousing arias, Crazy Joey Gallo prepares to go to war with one of New York's most powerful mafia families. But to the rest of the gang, Joey's mission is suicidal. The Gallows are basically sitting ducks here on the Red Hook waterfront. It's a ragtag gang against literally a mafia family. Someone in the Gallo gang gets cold feet and tips off the police to the impending war. It's a betrayal that will save their lives. Like the cavalry coming over the hills, the Brooklyn police launch a 24-7 surveillance operation. The NYPD set up a several block radius of protection around the Gallo headquarters to try and stop any Profacis from coming in and causing this bloodbath. For now, Joey and his brothers may be safe. But they are prisoners in their own HQ. Winter draws in, and unable to run their criminal activities, the swaggering gallows are broke and living in squalor. The situation with the gallows got very bleak. Con Ed shuts off their power. Half of the gang leaves. I mean, these guys are just barely hanging on. Desperate for cash, Joey decides to exhort payments from a local bar owner, Teddy Moss. He didn't realize that Teddy Moss wasn't an easy kind of guy to go along with, okay? By now, Joey's stock is so low that even a local bar owner brushes him off. He thought Teddy Moss would fold like a cheap suit. No way. Teddy Moss was like, you're not taking a piece of my business. I worked my ass for this business. Teddy Moss goes straight to the cops. It's just the break they've been looking for. The cops and the DA, they knew who he was. It was the perfect opportunity to get this guy off the street. And that's what they did. December 1961. Gallo is convicted of conspiracy and extortion. This time, the system wins and hits the rebel with a severe punishment. The evidence was overwhelming. He got sentenced to seven to 14 years in, uh, in prison. With crazy Joey Gallo locked up, order is restored to the Mafia underworld, for now. They jailed Joey right in the midst of this gallo profaci war, so the Gallos effectively lose their Che Guevara. Joey Gallo does his best to acclimatize to life behind bars. While in prison, Joey Gallo begins a second phase of life. He suddenly discovers books. The once violent and impulsive Gallo cools his heels behind bars, reading books and painting. Outside, the world is changing, and any problems the hothead may have had disappear. His arch enemy, Joe Profacci, dies, and the new don of the Profacci family is hard-boiled Brooklyn mobster, Joe Colombo. Colombo has no interest in avenging old wrongs. He's too busy running his criminal empire and forging links with the local Italian community. March 1971, and Gallo is released, apparently reformed. He makes straight for his old beatnik family, where he finds himself a bit of a celebrity. When Joey comes out of prison, he strangely finds himself in the midst of this fashionable New York literati circuit. To America's counterculture heavyweights like Bob Dylan and Arthur Miller, Crazy Joey's revolutionary gangster mystique is too cool to resist. They see a romantic outsider figure He's on the outside of whatever side there was. Is this countercultural, uh, you know, anti-hero going against the system? With his new counterculture buddies, Joey Gallo looks set for a glamorous new chapter. 
when Joe Colombo hears that Joey Gallo is coming to see him, alarm bells go off. He's right to worry. Beneath the flower power hipster burns an irrepressible desire for revenge. Joey can't resist reprising his old role one last time. Joey Gallo is not a normal human being. He's not somebody who goes to prison and comes out rehabilitated. No. What did he spend the eight years in jail doing? Plotting. And every single day he spent behind bars was filled with more and more rage. Joey Gallo wasn't just painting in the slammer. He had a maverick ruse to remain one step ahead of his enemy. In prison, Joey Gallo had a vision of combining forces with the African-American gangsters of Harlem. Fraternizing with black inmates, Joey worked to swell the Gallo gang membership and once again defied convention. Joey Gallo's recruitment of black inmates that he met in prison was uh, certainly unorthodox. The mafia always used Jewish hitmen, Irish hitmen, but there was no real association with black mobsters or any way of affiliating with them. So it was a very smart move by Joey. Joey wastes no time in letting Colombo know that Joey Gallo isn't going to go away. And he goes and he meets, he's a sit down with Joe Colombo and he said, all these years I did in the can, you guys owe me some respect, you owe me some, some money. Joe immediately demands a $100,000 gift because he had never agreed to the truce. And he wants a bigger cut of the Colombo family activities. Colombo is well aware of Gallo's reputation. It's a critical moment for the boss. He knows how dangerous Gallo can be, but he's got a reputation to keep. Colombo makes a big call. Colombo went, yeah, I'll tell you what, here's a grant. He throws a thousand on the table. He says, here, you know what you do? You go have yourself a great welcome home dinner. Joe Colombo wanted no part of Joey Gallo. He knew he was wild and crazy and that he was a potential nemesis, and he wasn't going to play ball with Joey Gallo. It's a big mistake. Joey Gallo basically throws it back in his face, and he's like, yeah, you think this, this gang war's over? You know, it's just started. The rage inside Gallo is building and building and building. He basically announces Columbo's dead. He's a dead man. The Gallo Profaci War was back on. He thought he would be the next boss of the Colombo family and would be known as the Joey Gallo family. With a new war threatening to erupt, Colombo knows he has to move fast. The reaction by the family against Joey Gallo for putting a hit out on Joe Colombo is death. They put out an open contract on Joey Gallo if Joey's going down, he's going to make sure he takes Columbo with him. And his new prison contacts will ensure that no one sees it coming. Gallo knows no one will be expecting an assassin from Harlem. So he hires an unknown two-bit drug addict. Crazy Joey Gallo, the maverick mobster, has broken the rules and finally taken down a leading mafia don. And he must know the transgression cannot go unpunished. You don't take out a boss like that. It is reckless, and there are going to be repercussions. Colombo's men instantly renew the open contract on Joey's life. I knew that they were going to go after Joey then, and Informants came back all over the place. It's an open contract out on Joey. That means anybody could hit him anytime. 
but Crazy Joe isn't afraid of anyone. He's emboldened by what he thinks is a victory over the Profaci family. He was just reckless. He just lived for the day. He didn't care about tomorrow. Open contract or not, Joey knows that in the movies, the hero always wins in the end. This guy was a psychopathic killer. His ego was unbelievable. He was invincible. He's going to live forever. I'm Joe Gallo. April 6th, 1972. Little Italy. Joey is celebrating his 43rd birthday with his entourage. They're sitting in the back and they're having a nice dinner with clams and shrimp and all that stuff. And everything's fine. They ordered another round. It's probably five o'clock in the morning by now. Without warning, four gunmen burst in and begin shooting. The executioner's bullet pierces Joey's carotid artery. Detective Mike Sheenan was one of the first cops on the scene. I looked down and I said, you know who that is? So that's Joey Gallo. Joey Gallo. That's crazy Joey Gallo. And he was gone. It's a fitting climax for a man who modeled himself on a Hollywood noir gangster. Joey Gallo simply had to go down in a hail of bullets. Joey Gallo's really living out his ultimate movie fantasy by getting gunned down in spectacular fashion in front of Umberto's Clam House in Little Italy. Embraced by a New York fashionable elite as a counterculture anti-hero, Joey Gallo's funeral is attended by hundreds of mourners. It's an example of the naivety of a lot of people, including Bob Dylan, who writes a song about him. Joey was sophisticated enough that he acted like he was really innocent and that he was a victim of society, not somebody who victimized society. Behind the romanticized image hid a different man, capable of ruthless brutality and cold-blooded murder, who started one of the bloodiest wars in the history of the Mafia and rocked the mob to its core. <laughs> 